It's Wednesday night, and our subject is the history of Israel. We've been going through the Old Testament, and we went through Genesis, and I think most of you here will admit for two and a half years while we were in Genesis, it was very interesting. Every character, every event, every situation, and we went through definitions of their names and words all through the book. It took us two and a half years to go through Genesis. We've been in Exodus for quite some time. And what I want you to see is the formation of everything. I want, to see this. I want you to see the structure of everything. We're going through the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. This is what is called the law or Torah. Now, the Protestants call it Pentateuch. Pent is five, and Pentateuch means five books, the first five books of the Bible. J then Joshua and Judges. Now, Joshua and Judges is about Israel coming back to the land that was given to Abraham in Genesis 15. Excuse me, Genesis 17. 17, he was promised the land, then it was given to... It was given to Isaac in Genesis 17, given to Jacob in Genesis 28. And then Exodus is about their exit, E-X-I-T, exit from Egypt. And that's where we are, from Egypt. We're going to see they leave Egypt in Exodus, Exodus 12. This is, this is where they're leaving Egypt. And then they come to, the, to Mount Sinai in Exodus, the 19th chapter. In the 20th chapter, we see Moses coming down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. And then uh, we, he, is, he comes to the mountain, and they're in Sinai at this point. So, as they leave Egypt, uh, there's preparations in verse 13, uh, chapter 13. Chapter 14 is their actual leaving Egypt and going through the Red Sea. And this is Pharaoh pursuing them. It pursues the uh, Israelites. And, of course, Pharaoh and his armies are destroyed in chapter 14. And then in chapter 19, they get to the mountain, and Moses goes up onto the mountain, and they don't leave Sinai until Numbers, the 10th chapter. Now, between Exodus and Numbers, you have the book of Leviticus. Now Moses is procuring the law, part of it here, through Exodus. You'll see uh, how that God is setting up the vessels of the tabernacle and he's giving instructions how they're to be made during this, uh, during this time period. And then uh, in Leviticus, we see the law of the Levites. That's where Leviticus, Leviticus, that's where that comes from, law of Levites. And the Levites, these were the sons of Levi, the third son of Jacob. The third son of Jacob. Jacob's got 12 sons. And the third son, that's Levi, he has the priesthood. And Levi has three sons, Gershom, Merari, and Koath. And all of these men have a job as Levites around the tabernacle of God. There's the tabernacle. And all the Levites, there's the veil, the Ark of the Covenant, the seven candlesticks, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense. And this is the brazen altar, the brazen sin. These are all made of gold in here. You've got six 
pieces of furniture with the tabernacle. And the Levites minister, they're the priesthood of God. Priesthood. Only priests can offer sacrifice and work in and around the temple of God. And Kohath has a son named, uh, he has a son named Amram. And out of Amram will come two very prominent sons, Aaron, the firstborn, and Moses, his younger brother, who's three years younger than him. And Moses, of course, is a Levite. He is a priest of God. But you had to be a son of Aaron to be a high priest. So unless you're of the lineage of Aaron, you cannot be a high priest. So all the laws of the Levites concerning all of the rituals and all of the everything from Passover to Pentecost to the day, the the feast of in gathering which is the day of uh, which is the uh, feast of huts which is also the feast of tabernacles and in that same month that's the seventh month uh, Passover comes in the first month of their uh, uh, ecclesiastical year that's March April or the month Nisan on their calendar and the seventh month is September October or the month Tishri on their calendar. So everything that goes on in these feasts of God happens among the Levites, and that's the laws of the Levites in Leviticus. And then Numbers, when they leave, in the 10th chapter of Numbers, they leave Mount Sinai, and from that 10th chapter until the end of Deuteronomy, which is the 33rd chapter. The 33rd chapter is where Moses dies. Now Moses is forbidden from going across the river and leading the people across the Jordan River. If this is, this is Israel, here's Egypt down here, down here. Here's the Sinai Peninsula, and they're wandering around here for 40 years, 40 years, and we'll go through all of that. And Moses, uh, they come up here through the land of Moab. Ammon is north of that. They don't get up to Ammon. They go just north of the Dead Sea, and they come into the land, cross the Jordan River, and then they're supposed to go in here and drive all these pagans out that 650 years before this land was given to Abraham in that 17th chapter of Genesis, passed on to Isaac, then to Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. And 650 years later, in those 650 years, all these pagans move in to possess that land that was given to Abraham uh, the Amorites move in there, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the, all these ites come in, and they're pagans. And so they come after 40 years in the wilderness. The book of Numbers, when they leave, when they leave Sinai in the 10th chapter, when they leave Sinai in the 10th chapter, and you can read it and you see it's as plain as the nose on your face. They're leaving Sinai. And they camp. And of course, the way they know to leave, how do they know how to leave? Huh? What? That fire by night and a cloud by day, during the day, the cloud would start moving. That meant you see this cloud going. Hey, get everything, get going. And the Kohathites, they had to take care. If you wasn't a son of Aaron, they had to load up all of these, put all these uh, uh, various clothing for the tabernacle together, roll it up in an exact fashion, and it all had to be carried on staves, and they'd see that cloud moving. Well, Numbers 10 says they leave. So from Numbers the 10th chapter through the end of Deuteronomy, the 33rd chapter, that is the book of Numbers. 
Deuteronomy, all the travels is in the book of Numbers. Deuteronomy means second law. Duo. Nomos. Nomos is the Greek word law. Duo, we think of a duo as a duet. And, and Deuteronomy uh, is second law. It's the second witness to all these other laws. Anything that was said over here, back here in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, or Numbers, that's a law. Deuteronomy will repeat most of that. And it takes two witnesses to verify something in Israel. Now, where we are, I want us to get back to where we are. We are in the 14th chapter, and they're just leaving Egypt. Now, I want you to keep in mind, everything, let me put it over here. This is Egypt. Here's the Red Sea. And here's the Sinai Peninsula. And there's Arabia. And here's Israel. And I want you to keep in mind that when they cross the Red Sea, all these travelings in, in the wilderness, this is a picture in a type. God calls His people, His people, that he chose, he said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. I didn't choose you because you're greatest of nations. I chose you and you were the smallest. But you didn't choose me and Egypt can't choose me. I'm a savior only to those that I choose. So as they're leaving Egypt, they are a picture of, they are God's elect. Just like we are God's elect in the New Testament. And we're called out of Egypt or out of this world. Egypt is a type and a picture of this world. The world or it's a type of sin. We're called out of this world to head towards the promised land or towards heaven. There's so many songs that have been written about the promised land. I am bound for the promised land and I am bound. The reason they are written that way is because it pictures us as being in this wilderness overcoming sin and overcoming adversity and everything that we study everything that we study in the New Testament is spiritually talking about the shadow over here and we're going into heaven or into God's rest and they're headed up there and God's going to destroy all his enemies that are part of Israel those that don't believe and there are people that come into the church and they are spots on the love feast and they try to feast with us and God will destroy them. He only calls His people that believe to come into the promised land. Now, where we are, we are in the 14th chapter and I want us to go back there. 14th chapter of Exodus. They're leaving the land. They're leaving Egypt, going into the wilderness and they're about to cross the Red Sea and they're fleeing Pharaoh, and God hardens Pharaoh's heart. God hardened his heart. You have to realize. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Nine, ten. Let me put them. Nine, ten. God hardened Pharaoh's heart after the first plague of turning the water to blood. The second plague, the third plague, he kept hardening Pharaoh's heart. And then, with the death of the firstborn in Egypt, with the blood put up on the doorpost of the houses of the Israelites, those firstborn inside would be spared. And when I see the blood, I will pass over. The Passover, I'll pass over you, was the tenth plague in Egypt. Well, with that tenth plague, God softened Pharaoh's heart. Softened his heart to let the people go. He said, I'll harden his heart so he won't let the people go. And then when he lets them go in chapter 14, he lets them go in chapter 12. And he says, okay, you can leave. In chapter 14, when he lets them go, they're coming to Egypt. And God hardens Pharaoh's heart again. Hardens it and says, I've changed my mind. I'm not going to let the people go. And so he chases Israel 
up to the border of the Red Sea. Let me paint the picture for you again. Here's Israel. Here is an army, perhaps six, eight hundred, maybe a thousand chariots. I mean, just roaring and snorting. Those horses just breathing hard and, and those soldiers with those armor on and those bows and those, and those spears in their hands and they're coming after Israel. And Israel says, here they come. And Moses is, and the people begin to murmur against God. It's as though after ten plagues and after the miracles that God performed in Egypt, Israel doesn't get it any more than the people today. They don't get it either. God said, I will be with you always. I'll deliver you in times of trouble. Nothing is going to overtake you. If I was able to destroy the most powerful army upon the face of the earth, believe me, I can take care of this. If I be able to perform these miracles, I can take care of this army. And what happens is where we are right now. But let's get back over here in verse 10 of chapter 14. When Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. They were terrified. They could see the Egyptians coming after them. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. They said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt. What do they mean, because there were no graves in Egypt? Because there were no Jewish graves in Egypt on the night of the Passover, because all the Jews had the blood over the doorposts, and none of their firstborn died, and there was a firstborn in every one of the houses of the Egyptians, then they died. They said, and they're murmuring against God. Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? They're murmuring against God, aren't they? Let me just kind of preview some things for you before we go any further. Let me just preview ahead of time so you'll know what's happening when we get there. Look at 16, chapter 16. They've left Egypt. Pharaoh's armies are drowned. And that happens later in that 14th chapter. But in the 16th chapter, they're headed into the wilderness. And their journey from Elam. Now, Elam means it's just a place in the desert. No one knows where it is. They're coming out of Egypt. Coming out of Egypt. Elam is somewhere in this desert of Sinai Desert out here. We don't... It couldn't be far into the desert because they haven't traveled very long. So they come to Elam and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai and we don't know where Sinai is and we don't know where Elam is. We know Sinai is in Arabia according to the fourth chapter of Galatians. But we're not sure where those boundary lines were Arabia today is all this over here. Do I believe they had time to get over here from over here in just a day or so? No, with a million of them traveling. No, two million, two and a half million people. Nope, don't believe they had time to get over here in what we call Arabia today. In all probability, the borders of Arabia were over here because they're not traveling long, just a day or so. In 10 days, they're going to be at Sinai. Do you actually believe they can come well here even in 10 days? Now, not walking, you have to stop and use your brain once in a while. Just think. Now, here in 16, and between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. They're murmuring again. They're griping and complaining again. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots. We had plenty flesh to eat. And when we did eat bread to the full, for you've brought us forth into the wilderness to kill this assembly with hunger. Didn't take long for them to lose their faith, did it? 
And then God says, I'll rain bread from heaven in the next verse. Now, I'm just giving you a little preview. Look at 17. Look at chapter 17. They're still griping. They hadn't even got started. And they don't ever quit griping. Have you ever griped about your plight in the wilderness and you think that everybody's being unfair to you? Yeah. Who said yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you, Victor. I appreciate that. Now, in 17, verse 1, All the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim where there was no water for the people to drink. And guess what they do? They start griping again. Wherefore, the people... Wherefore, the people did chide with Moses. They griped at him. They complained and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why are you chiding with me? Therefore, do you tempt the Lord? He's the one that did this. Don't you know that all things work together for good to them that love God? Don't you know he wants it this way? Now, I'll be going through these chapters. I just want you to see how Israel gripes and complains. Look at Numbers 13. Now, they're over at Sinai, and they're leaving Sinai. We've already got the Levitical law and got all of this going on. Numbers 13. These people really don't get it. Well, they've left. They've left Sinai. Sinai, what happens at Sinai? They get the law. Moses goes up on the mountain. There in the 19th chapter, and he gets this law uh, all the way through Numbers, the 10th chapter. And they have left Sinai, and they've come to the place called Kadesh Barnea. And Kadesh Barnea, we don't know exactly where it is. Let me erase this. They've come out here. Here's Egypt. They've come out here into this Sinai Peninsula. Let's just call this the Red Sea here. And here's Egypt over here. And they've come out here. Come down here to Sinai. Let's just say it's down here. And then they've left and come to Kadesh Barnea. Kadesh. And God tells them, go over into the land of, the, of Anak. Now, we don't know what the boundaries of Israel are. I'm just kind of putting it kind of similar the way it is today. And this is the land of Anak, or later on it was called the land of the Philistines. Today we call that same area the Gaza Strip. Now, this is where the Palestinians live as well as the West Bank here. Now... So they, they get up here and God tells them, go up here into the land of Anak and they get up there and they send spies there. Spies. The spies go in and they see these giants. In all probability, since that is, that is the land of the Philistines later on, and in, northern, in the northern land of the Philistines is the city of Gath, so in all probability, these are ancestors of Goliath of Gath. They certainly must be because this is a strain of people that are real tall and they live in the very same area as Goliath rises up many hundreds of years later. They say these guys are too big. They forgot that God destroyed this army. My problems are too big, God. You just don't understand what I am going through. You ever said that to the Lord? God, you just don't know. You've never had this kind of problem before with David or with Samson or with... Huh? Samson took the jawbone of an ass and killed a thousand Philistines? He's never had that kind of problem like you have in your personal life. But look here in... So the people come back. Verse 31... <clears throat> In chapter 13. But the men that went up with 
him with Caleb, we said, we be not able to go up against these people. They're too big. They're too tall. And do you know that they brought back a stalk of grapes that took two men carrying them on, his, on their shoulders, one on one end, the other on the other end, and all it was was a big stalk of grapes. They were so heavy. We can't go in there. But God has already destroyed the largest army in the world at this point. They're griping again. Sounds like Christians in America, doesn't it? Does it sound like you at some time in your life? <laughs> First of all, they're out here in the desert when it's impossible to take care of two and a half million people, which is estimated according to the figures that we have in the book of Numbers of how many people left Egypt. Because they never counted men and women. You can count up the number of men, and usually you can count, since they didn't practice birth control, seven and eight, kids in a family, maybe ten sometimes. Jacob had twelve. Ishmael had twelve sons. Jacob had thirteen. He had a daughter named Dinah. They had had ten, twelve, thirteen kids, fourteen kids. So there very well could have been two and a half to three million people leaving Egypt in this desert. But the men that went up with him said, we're not able to go up against these people for they're stronger than we are. What does strength have to do with anything? It reminds me of, of, look over to Ecclesiastes. They're stronger. What are you talking about? What's that have to do with anything? Look at chapter 9, verse 11. I returned and saw under the sun. I saw upon the earth. Under the sun means the things that happening upon the earth. That's what it means. I saw under the sun, Ecclesiastes 9, 11. And I saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift. It's not always the hare that wins. The tortoise will win if some miraculous thing comes on. If he gets one of them jet packs on his back like you see in the cartoon. And sometimes God will put a jet pack on your back. Nor the battle to the strong. It's not the strongest man that's going to win. Do you know that it's estimated that Alexander the Great had only about 30,000 men in his army when he would attack the great bear, the Persian armies, and they'd have a million, million and a half, two million men. But he was like, he was, he was called a leopard because the leopard is a killer. It's a killing machine. It would be like, He'd attack the haunches of the bear here and he'd pull over and attack here. And he was such a great military strategist. People, he, his tactics are studied at West Point today. The guy was a genius. I saw a special on him one night on uh, Discovery Channel. Some of the things he would come up with, it's like nobody thought of that before. One of the things he came up with, when you're being charged by chariots, and he didn't study the chariots or the charioteers. It's not what he studied to see how he could overcome them. If you're being charged by those, by those iron chariots and they have wheels like this and they've got these big scythes out here, sharp scythes, if you're looking at it from the front or the rear and the chariot is here, and these wheels, and he would just rip people apart. He didn't study that. He didn't study the, the men that driving the chariots. He studied the horses. How do you get a horse to stop? And they said in this special, he would take, Alexander the Great studied the horses, and he found that if you drive a horse up into a open area, it will stop. So he'd have his men just unfold the line. They'd have a straight line. Have them unfold the line. Open it up. The horse would run in there and stop. And they'd kill the charioteers. And they had the chariot. It's like, who ever thought of that? The problem with the chariots was the thing that drove the chariots. And it wasn't the man holding the reins. It was the horse. If you're going to study how to stop somebody, get to the motor, right? 
And he did some really, really strange things. Where was I? So it wasn't... And he attacked Xerxes' army and did some of the weirdest things. He had uh, some very strange things he did. And he finally just beat down the great bear, the bear of the largest carnivore, and the Persians had the largest armies, and he whipped them. So the battle is not to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to, to them all. That's not our word chance. Don't mean accident. Chance is the word pagal. It's the exact same word as intercession. It means to intercede means to intercept. To intercept. If you're riding down a road and you see somebody crossing the highway here and two highways intersect there and you see a little girl, she's crossing right here and you see this car is running through this light and you're over here and you take a run at that car and you hit that car and knock it off the track and knock it up here somewhere, you've interceded or made intercession for that little girl walking across right there. It means to hit and, and knock and cause to strike and cause to go another direction. It's the New Testament word intuncano. N-T-U-G-C-H-A-N-O. Only God makes intercession. We don't do any interceding. The Holy Spirit makes intercession there in Romans the ninth chapter. Now, so let's go back over here. Let's go back over. God makes intercession. Now, where were we? 13. 13. And verse uh, 31. But the men that went up with him said, We're not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. They have forgotten. Either that or these are some of the unbelievers that are going to be killed off in the wilderness. Because there's going to be, for 40 years they're going to be in the wilderness, a day, a year for every day of those spies in this 14th chapter that was sent up there. God says, I'm going to give you a year for every day to kill off all men from 20 years old and upward, which is military age in Israel, and I'm going to kill off everybody except Caleb and Joshua. Why Caleb and Joshua? They're the only two of the men that went up there to Anak that wanted to go back and conquer the Anakims. They said, we'll go. And you find in the book of Judges when they come back to possess the land that Caleb is there and Joshua is there leading them and Caleb's nephew is the first judge of Israel. Now let's keep reading. And they brought up an evil report of the land. Evil report is talking about it was evil concerning the people of Israel because it was too much for them to handle. Well, certainly it was too much for them to handle. But it wasn't too much for God to handle. You say, I can't handle this problem in my life. I'm having problems. I'm having financial problems. I'm having job problems. I'm having this problem or that problem. Well, who do you think put you in that place? Everybody here has got problems that they think they can't handle. Who do you think put you there? Who do you think brought Israel out here? You think he brought them out here so they will die? And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants there. It'll eat you alive. It'll gobble you up. These people are too big for us. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature, the Anakims. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which, some of the, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight like grasshoppers. Now we know that Goliath was approximately nine foot six. They felt so significant. And men on the average back then were shorter than they are today. So the Israelites may have been five foot tall. 
Whew. Can you imagine coming up against some guy that's twice your height? And so we were in their sight. We were like grasshoppers. Chapter 14. Now the people start murmuring again. They just don't get it, do they? And the children of Israel and all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried and the people wept that night and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses. Never quit complaining, did they? And against Aaron and in the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt. They keep saying that, don't they? I wish I could die. My life is useless. I've come this far. I can't get the job I want. I can't have the house I want. I can't have the things I want. And I, you know why you're doing that? You're looking around what everybody else has. You're comparing yourself with what everybody else has rather than being content with such things as you have. Paul said, I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Well, when did he write that? In Philippians 4 and 11. The book of Philippians is one of his last epistles. He was in prison in Rome under a Roman guard waiting to be executed when he wrote that. And he said, I had to learn through a lifetime of people chasing me and trials. I've learned to be content. Content is the word autarkase. Remember that word? A-U-T-A-R-K-E-S. It comes from auto, which is the word self, and archaeo. It means to ward off self. Remember, demons are self. Ward off the demon of self. Daemonion is the word demon. It means to distribute fortunes. So I have to ward off the fortunes of self. The only reason we gripe and complain is because we think we don't have the things that we deserve. Isn't that right? I deserve better treatment than this. I deserve more recognition. And I think somebody needs to give me a big round of applause. And God, I need uh, what these other people have. I want his personality and her looks and his money. You don't deserve anything. You could have, like Warren Buffett has, you could have $60 billion that it would be impossible to repent of and then go to hell one day. Do I believe Warren Buffett's going to heaven? No. Do I believe Robert Rubens, who has 58,000 employees worldwide, is going to heaven? No, I don't believe that. How hardly shall a rich man enter? Sometimes we forget that we are the privileged by being called of God and put through tribulation. We must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. If your trials are difficult, stop griping like Israel. That provokes God to anger. And all through this chapter, Israel is griping and complaining and murmuring. And God says in verse 11, The Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? Oops. Provoke. How long will they provoke me? What did I preach about Sunday night? The spiritual, spiritual Sabbath. Look over there in Hebrews, the third chapter. Remember this? Hebrews, third chapter. Hebrews 3. In Hebrews 3, verse 8, Harden not your hearts as in the provocation when Israel provoked me in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. All the time you were in the wilderness, you saw me overcome your enemies. Why are you griping? You actually believe that God is going to leave you alone? Well, my family problems. I got family problems. And you just don't understand, Jim. I know all about it. My family doesn't talk to me. My sister, my brother, my mother, if she's alive, they don't. I witnessed to my mother, and she didn't want, want to hear the truth. Tell her about predestination. She'd say, don't you talk about that around me, Jimmy. You talk about that, I'll make you uh, leave me. I'll make you get out of the car with me. I won't have you around me preaching that. Whew. 
Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation. I was grieved with that generation and said, Do they do always err? Planeo, P-L-A-N-E-O. They do wander after imposters. They wander. It comes from a similar word which means an imposter. They're following the wrong thing. They're following their opinion. So I swear in the wrath. It says my wrath in the King James Bible, but it is the wrath. So I swear in the wrath. Tay or gay. The wrath. Feminine gender. Feminine gender. How can it be feminine? Babylon is the mother of all idolatry. Babylon is the mother of idolatry. It actually says harlotry, and harlotry is the word pornea, and it means idolatry. And the Bible says covetousness is idolatry, and covetousness, pleonectes, means want more, and did Israel want more in the wilderness? Yes, they wanted more of what was back in Egypt. I wish I was back in the sin where I used to be so life would be easier. It's not supposed to be easy being a believer. There is no way to heaven with an easy gospel. If the righteous scarcely be saved, molest with great difficulty. Where do the ungodly and the sinner appear? Salvation is not easy. God makes it hard on us just like He made it hard on them. It's supposed to be hard on you. Where would you ever get this? It's supposed to be some easy pathway. It's called a narrow way. Narrow is the word to leave, but it means tribulation. You mean we must do much tribulation into the kingdom of God and you think tribulation is going down here and getting ice cream cold and Baskin Robbins? I'm afraid not. Well, this is too hard to live. I know that. That's why God has to come in your life and over the years and over the period of time to make you realize this is the way you have to live regardless of the cost. You have to forsake all that you have or you cannot be a disciple of Christ there in Luke 14, 33. You have to be willing to forsake everything. Did they forsake everything in Egypt? Yep, they left Egypt went out here in the desert to live for 40 years. And God's saying, stop this griping and complaining back over here to, to this 14th chapter. And God says to Moses, the Lord said unto Moses, verse 11, chapter 14 of Numbers, how long will the people provoke me? These are the days of provocation. Not one provocation, the days of provocation, plural. They provoke me over and over. Do you think we're only going to read this two or three times here? Going through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and they only provoke God. They provoked him. They provoked, I'll get it right in a minute. They provoked him over and over and over and over. And you can't get out of it. And the, even when they got back in the promised land, he said, if you go after other gods, I'll send the sword, famine, the pestilence, and the beast. And they did. And he did. Why do you think he called his people by another name? But he planned that too, didn't he? In Romans 11 and 11, did Israel just stumble just to fall? No, they stumbled so that salvation will come to the Gentiles. And then he says, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them will make of thee a great nation and mightier than they. And Moses said unto the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear this, Lord. For thou broughtest up this people in thy might from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of the land. For they have heard that thou, Lord, art among this people, that thou, Lord, art face to face, and that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by day or in a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire by night. Now if thou shalt kill all the people as one man, all of Israel, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, 
because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he sware unto them, therefore he hath killed them in the wilderness. People will say, why did God speak this way and then have Moses speak that way? I keep saying this. If God is going to have mercy, if God is going to have mercy, you have to have something opposite of mercy. Mercy is, it is compassion because someone needs compassion. You don't have to be merciful when you go into a room full of millionaires. Say, let's take an offering for these guys. Do you? You don't have to do that. You don't have to feel sorry for somebody that's got everything. Do you? No. You're only merciful because there is wrath. If God is going to have mercy and he ordains everything, he has to create his own wrath. You mean God likes to have wrath? Yes, he does. That sounds strange. If everything, I keep saying, if everything in the world was sweet, if pie was sweet and ice cream was sweet and lemons were sweet and pickles were sweet and there was no such thing as sour or bitter, what would you call sweet? It would have no definition, would it? In order to have one thing, you have to have something to measure it against sour, bitter. So if God is going to have mercy, he's got to create his own wrath, doesn't he? You understand what I'm saying? He, he's got, people say, why does God get angry? Because he wants to. God willing to show the wrath of the people and make his power known. He wants people to see his rage and his fury. So he makes these vessels of wrath that are fitted to destruction and he, these men of natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, he's going to say, if I can't show my power on somebody, nobody's going to know what kind of power I've got. And I can't show it upon my children, so I've got to create me some people to show my wrath upon. And that's part of it. People say, well, that don't make any sense. Well, that's because you can't think like God thinks. He says, you, your thoughts aren't my thoughts. You can't think like I think. As the heavens are higher than the earth, it, so are my ways and your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. My thinking and your thinking. If he works all things after the counts of his own will, he works wrath. So he actually ordains Moses' prayer here, doesn't he? He has to. Now if thou kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard thy fame will be speaking, saying the Lord wasn't able to save his people. And he goes on down in here. These are definitely the days of provocation. He says in verse 23, Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. Everyone that came against me, I know everyone's heart, and I'll destroy these for 40 years in the wilderness. And he says over here in verse 34, you want to know where this is? Look at 34 of this chapter. After the number, well, let's read 33 and 34. Your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years and bear your whoredoms until their carcasses be wasted in the wilderness after the number of days in which you search the land, even 40 days, each day for a year shall you bear your iniquities even 40 years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. He said, you were up there 40 days in the land of Anak. That's why you're going to be out here. Now, gosh, I got so much more. I don't have, I'm just kind of giving you some of these. He says in 14, they're still murmuring in 14, 14 and uh 11 through 27. I just don't have time to read all that. Verse 26 and 27. The Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil generation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. 
Say to them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness, and all you were numbered of you according to your whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me. That was military age. Twenty years old. Those are the guys that murmured and says, You got those giants in the land. We don't want to go in and fight. They're like nine feet tall. Now, chapter 20 of Numbers. I got to get back to the regular message. Chapter 20. Verse 1, then came the children of Israel, even the, they're in the middle of the desert, they're out there, wandering around, even the whole congregation into the desert of Zin in the first month, and people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there, that's Moses' sister, Moses and Aaron's sister, and was buried there, and there was no water for the congregation, guess who's going to get angry because of that? You would think after all these miracles, Water out of a rock, salvation from their enemies, bread in the morning. He even told them earlier in, in this book or in Exodus, I'll give, they said, give us meat. We want meat. He said, I'll give you, I'll give you doves in the evening till it's coming out your nostrils, and he did. There was no water for the congregation. They gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and the people chod with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord, and why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord unto the wilderness, that we and our cattle should die there? These guys don't get a hold of it, do they? But it sounds a whole lot like the so-called Christians in America. I'm having a hard time. It sounds to me like people that grit to complaining. Sounds like me some years ago. Just be real blunt. And wherefore have you made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place? Is it no place of seed or figs or vines or pomegranates? Neither are there any water to drink? Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They fell upon their faces and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And then... God tells Moses to speak to a rock and we'll come back to that. Let's go back over to the 14th chapter of Exodus. I could go give you 32 and 1 of Numbers. 32 and 1, I was going to give you that. They're murmuring against God all through here. And he's got them out in the desert. He's giving them water to drink. He's giving them food to eat. He's conquering their enemies. And he's not leaving them. Lo, I'll, I'll not leave you. I'll not forsake you. I'm, lo, I'm with you all the way even to the end of the world. And people don't believe that. God has done so many miraculous things in our lives by leading us out of this world and leading us into this pathway of tribulation and fire. And believe me, he'll take you all the way through. He that hath begun a good work and you will perform it all the way till the day of Jesus Christ. You say, but this don't feel good to me. Well, he calls that chastising and scourging so that you can be a partaker of his holiness, so you can learn. I've had, I had to learn that what I wanted was not what I want. You understand what I'm saying? What I wanted in the past is not what I want now. It takes a long time to come to the place of wanting the right thing. God has to fix our wants. He makes me want spiritual things now. I'm not interested in material things. I'm interested in serving God, helping people, picking them up, and helping take care of their trials. But while you're going through the trials, don't murmur and complain against God because what you're doing, you're griping about the sovereign will of the living God. That's what the book of Jude says. We murmur against God. Now, let's go back over here to the 14th chapter of Exodus. See if I can't. All right. All right. Now, we're over here at Exodus, 14th chapter. How much time do I have, Mike? All right. Now, they're coming up to 
They're coming into an impossible situation, just like most of you have been. Has anybody ever been in an impossible situation to overcome? And I'm not talking to you like a charismatic. I'm not talking that God's going to make your situation possible by raining money down upon you and making you rich and wealthy and healthy. I'm telling you, God's going to rain whatever he wants to rain upon you. The amazing thing about God is he makes you happy with the things that he wants you to have instead of the things that you want you to have. He overcomes your wants and your desires. He changes our direction in us, and that's called repentance, and makes us want the things of God, not the things of this earth. The things of this earth are temporal. The things of eternity are eternal. The things of God are eternal. Now, let's look here. He says, as... In verse 12, Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? Moses, we told you we were fine over there. We didn't even know who you were, and we didn't even know this God you're having us to follow. For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians in our sin than that we should die in this wilderness. What's happening here? They're not believing God. That's unbelief. They can't enter into God's rest. The ones that have unbelief, God's going to make them wander in the wilderness for 40 years till he kills off all unbelief. And understand this. When you get to the end of Deuteronomy, all the unbelief in Israel is dead. Israel enters into the promised land with nothing but believers only. In chapter 33, and you go into Joshua and Judges. Joshua goes in to conquer the land. And Judges, they go in to settle in the land. And everyone in Judges, when you get into Judges, they go under Judges. They had 13 Judges, starting with Othniel and ending with Samuel. And all this time, they're under Judges. And when they go into Judges in that second chapter, everyone is a believer. And the Bible says, in the second chapter of Judges, a new generation rose up that did not know God. And then they take off after Baal in the grove. It happens over and over and over. It wasn't any different in the wilderness as it was in Joshua and Judges or as it was in First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, they kept going after these gods, didn't they? They kept griping and complaining against Jehovah God, who chose them and called them out of Egypt. He kept saying that over and over and over. Did not bring you out of Egypt? What's wrong with you? Look here in chapter fourteen, verse thirteen. Moses said unto the people, Fear not. Stand still. Stand still. That word still is yatsab. It means stand firm. Yatsab. Y-A-T. S-A-B. Stand still. Yatsab means to continue doing what you're supposed to be doing and stand fast. You're up against the Red Sea. Here's the army of Pharaoh here coming in to get you. He's changed his mind. His heart is hardened and he's going to come in and kill all the Israelites. He is mad that he has been made a sucker. You've made me look like a fool. I won't put up with this. Let me read on here. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And I'm saying to you, stand still. He didn't mean everybody sit down and do nothing. As we said last week, he, the Bible tells us in Luke 19, 13, to occupy until I come. Occupy doesn't mean sit down. It means to busy oneself with work. Get busy. Well, here you are. You've got two and a half million Israelites up against the Red Sea. You've got Pharaoh's army coming in on them. God says, I'll take care of them. You do what you need to do. Change the baby's diapers. Feed some of these old women. Help some of them, they're leaning over. You, pay, you pretend there is no army back here. Okay, Moses? You got a work to do. You got two and a half million people. They're probably tired from traveling all day. 
cook a bunch of meals. Everybody set up your tents up against the Red Sea. I'll take care of the army. When I get ready to get you out of here, you'll get out of here. Boy, now that would take a lot of faith to believe that, wouldn't it? Yes, but Jim, you don't understand my situation. You ever had a situation you didn't think God was there in charge of? He ordered the situation. I don't care if it's a divorce, if it's losing your house, if it's having to get another apartment, you're buying on your rent. He ordered that. He wants it that way in your life until you learn to do things different so that you can learn to trust God. Yeah, but my mind gets all bent out of shape. That's where worry starts. Take no thought for your life what you'll eat or drink because he's already got this fixed. He says, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All of this will be taken care of. You're not going to be rich. You're going to have the car you want. He may give you the best bicycle you've ever had in your life. But that'll be the way he wants you to go to work. Won't it? Now, it's kind of like if you have a way to get around, what difference does it make? Only people who don't have super fancy cars want one. If a man is so rich that he can buy any super fancy car he wants, he doesn't see any sense in doing it. They've got a special called Born Rich. It's about all these rich kids out there and uh, kids of billionaires like the Johnson & Johnson family, like the Oscar Mayer people, the, uh, just super rich, even Warren Buffett's daughter is in this special. And it's that uh, you can see it. And one of the kids, his, he was 16 years old, and his dad, his, one of his uncles took him down to Grand Central Station in New York, and he said, this is yours. He said, I didn't know what to do with that. He said, I couldn't even process that in my mind. And as he got older, he drew money in three figures, like in the high three figures, six or eight hundred thousand dollars a year interest on his millions, long, on his millions investments. And he was an engineer working for fifty thousand a year. And he said, I could go buy a Maserati any time I wanted to, so why would I want to go do it? Because he couldn't show off the amount of money he had. Because he had too much to be able to show off. If you got all the money in the world, you can drive a gold Rolls Royce and it, Royce and it still doesn't show off your money, does it? So he says, why do I want to do it? Only people who think they're up there drive the big super fancy cars. When uh, H. Ross Perot was running for president and he's a billionaire, a uh, Texas billionaire, the little short guy that talked real fast like that, you know. Uh, he said that he, he, in 1992, he was driving an 84 Oldsmobile. He said, I'm not paying these prices for these cars. And he, these cars, and he's right. And he said, mine runs fine. It's only the people that want to get up there and show off that wants one of those. If you can buy a dozen of them, what do you need them for? You don't, do you? It's really funny when you get old, you don't, you don't have to have the things you used to think. You don't even want the things you used to want. I don't want the things I used to want. My wife is four foot eight and a half, about like this, y'all know that. And she has to buy a sports car, and most of them she can't fit in. And she's had all kinds of little sports cars. She has to try a car on, first of all, like you try on shoes. She has to be able to reach the pedals. She has to check the pedals, huh? So that is, you think that, I'm, that's no joke. That's no joke. See if she can get in there and see over the steering wheel with the pedals. And I was getting to the point, I forget what it was. Huh? Yeah. Well, oh, the point is, she had a little Miata. And I didn't like to drive it. Little convertible, real sporty. I said, it's sitting there in the driveway. Let's sell it. It's not, it's just, it's just getting old. I would have said that about a little Miata when I was 25. Hey, man, jump in there and take off. 
I wasn't any more interested in riding that than I was interested in getting in a, some buggy bumping up and down the road. I said, I don't like to sit down on the ground. I don't want to drive it. Never did want to drive it. When you get old, you don't want the things you wanted. Well, I think Solomon said that, Remember thou now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them in the days of my youth, in the things of my youth anymore. And that day will come, doesn't it? You don't want the things you wanted when you were 20, 25. Absolutely not. I look at cars and I'll say, that's really nice. Now, let's get back to work. I never envy a car anymore. Notice I said anymore. Never. I just look at him. A guy pulled into a station in a real, down here I was getting some gas. and He's in a 1970 Super Sport, boom, decked out. I said, I walked up and I said, only old men drive cars like that. And he said, only old men can afford them. <laughs> That's true. Now, let's get back to this. So, he says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Busy yourself, Moses. Do what you have to do. I'm taking care of Pharaoh's army, which will show to you today... For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. They're going to be dead at the end of the day. Now, that's what God says to us if we can learn to understand. He means what he says. He'll deliver us in the time of trouble. Why do you think David said that over and over and over again? The Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace and the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore Christ thou unto me, speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over this sea here. Now God's got ways out of your predicament that you can't visualize, and I'm not saying it's going to come tomorrow or next month or next year. God will take years to pull you out of an old frame of mind. And you won't even want, desire in any way the things that you used to want. That's the only thing that we fight about is they're fixing to take away the things from me that I think I want and I need. God has to change your wants. And lift up the rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they'll follow you. They're going to see there's a wall of water over here and one over here. I don't believe they went through a direct wall of water that was about 50 feet wide straight up. First of all, they had two and a half million people. In order to do that, one scholar said they'd have to, even if they lined up, lined up like threes and fours going in one column, it would take them days to get through there with two and a half to three million people. We're talking about all the people in Nashville and all of its surrounding uh, suburbs multiplied times two. That's what we're talking about. Everybody in Nashville, Hendersonville, Murfreesboro, Franklin, Lebanon, Fairview, Gallatin, all these people that live here walking through the Red Sea. Double it, and that's about what is walking through the Red Sea. And that's what God is feeding in the wilderness. If God can take care of that many people in the wilderness, shall it not much more clothe you, or ye of little faith? Consider the lily of the field, how they grow. They don't toil. They don't spin on a spinning wheel. Yet your heavenly Father... Uh, knows what you have need of. Look at the birds of the air. Your heavenly Father feeds them. He clothes the grass of the field. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore Christ thou unto me, speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward, and lift thou thine rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. 
Behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians. They'll follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh when I kill him. It, that's why God hardened his heart so he could be honored. Remember those words in Romans 9? when After he said, Jacob, have I loved? Esau, have I hated? And then he says unto Pharaoh, he saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose, have I raised thee up that I might show my power in thee? Remember that? Read that over there in Romans 9. In Romans 9, he says, For he said to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the Scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. And he hardened Pharaoh's heart to show his power. Back to chapter 14, verse 17. Behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them, and I will get me honor upon Pharaoh when I drown him and destroy him upon all his hosts, upon his chariots, upon his horsemen. These are vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. They don't have any chance or opportunity. Moses is not going to give them an invitation to him, say, won't you come and accept Christ? They don't have any chance. They're forbidden to hear God. God's hardening their hearts. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the angel of God which went before the camp of Israel, I believe the angel of God is Jesus, pre-incarnate, removed and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. To be a re-reward was a word in the Old Testament meant I'll take up the rear and I'll take up the head. I'll protect you from front and back. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. This fiery cloud divides. There's a space there between the Egyptians and Israel and God puts the fiery cloud right between them. And they can't get through the fire to get to. God will surround us a wall of fire about me. I have nothing now to fear. That's out of the second chapter of Zechariah. It's out of that song, Lily of the Valley. There'll be a wall of fire about us. The fire wasn't to hurt Israel. It's just like the fire when the three Hebrew children were in the fire there in Daniel not a hair of their sins. They didn't have, the hair of their head was singed. They didn't have the smell of smoke on them. The only thing that was burned when they were in the furnace was the bonds that held them. And that's all that will burn is the bonds that holds us. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these so that the one came not near the other all night. Here's, here's Pharaoh's armies here. Here's the fire Here's the children of Israel, and here's the Red Sea. There's one thing between Israel and its adversaries, and that's God. There's one thing between us and our adversaries, that is the living God. He's in that fire. That, I believe it's the same fire that stood over the tabernacle. Now, where was I? Verse 21. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea. It is the Lord to cause the sea to go back by strong east wind. The judgment of God is always spoken of as a strong east wind. Even God called Nebuchadnezzar's armies coming in to destroy Israel in the 36th chapter of 2 Chronicles a strong east wind. All that night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. All that night there was a tremendous wind to dry that floor up. I believe the floor of the Red Sea was as dry as dirt. They didn't have to trudge through mud to get through it. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea 
upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on the right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea. God will cause our enemies to come in after us and destroy them with the thing that saves us. His salvation will destroy our enemies while it saves us. Even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch, remember the watch was, the morning watch was three to six in the morning. You remember that? They had the midnight, they had the evening watch, six to nine. Uh, the evening watch, six to nine. The midnight watch, nine to twelve. The cockroach watch, twelve to three. And the morning watch was from three in the morning to six in the morning. And it came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. Now here's how he did it. He took off the chariot wheels that they drave them heavily. He got them down in the bottom of the Red Sea and went, poof, just popped them off. Took off the lug nuts that held them on there, I guess. Said, all right. No wheels. Now let's see you chase my people. God has peculiar ways of destroying his enemies, which we think are our enemies. They're just the enemies of God is what they are. If you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God and you're trying to destroy God's people. Do you know that nice people in the world are just like Pharaoh's armies? So that the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. They said, the Lord is fighting against the Egyptians, which is us. If God can do this, do you think he cannot take care of the little problems that you have? Now, he's not going to do it overnight. He took 400 years to take care of these problems, didn't he? Oh, I thought they just left Egypt. Yeah, but they had the problem for 400 years. They were in bondage. It, uh, you may all of a sudden come out one day, but that'll be after you've gone through fire and fire and more fire and more tribulation for 400 years. Or you'll think it's 400 years. And then he'll bring you out. I thought I would never get out of what I was into when I was young. I had so many problems. I could sit and name them to you. When I was about 27, 28, 30, 32, 33, 34. And I had a list as long as my arm. I can't even think of one anymore now. It was like, what was that, a fly? Was that a feather? Somebody hit me with a feather? That's what it feels like now. Was that important? Well, it seemed to be at the time, but it evidently it wasn't. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength. All the waters are coming back like a great flood. We're not talking about a few hundred yards. We're talking about a sea, several miles across, 15, maybe 20 miles across. God gets them right down in the bottom, pulls their chariot wheels off and say, now pursue my people. Hey, did you notice he didn't say, Moses, won't you ask them if they'd like to accept me as their personal Savior. Their hearts were hardened. They were going to hell. They were going to die. God didn't want them. He didn't love the Egyptians. Where do people get that God loves everybody? And the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it. They ran for their lives, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Isn't this a magnificent miracle? The odds are literally overwhelming. They are more than the Israelites can possibly Handle, just like you think your life is. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. Not one, including Pharaoh himself, was left. Pharaoh took his chariot down into the sea, the scripture says. 
But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. Notice he didn't love the Egyptians, did he? He didn't want the Egyptians. He called his people out of Egypt. He's calling us out of this world to go through the wilderness, to go through trials and tribulations for 40. You know, it's amazing. We have to go through all the judgments of God. There were four judgments, wasn't there? Any multiple of 10, 100, 1,000 to the Jewish mind was a form of the original number. Four. Four judgments. Four in the wilderness. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and His servant Moses for right now anyway. <laughs> Not permanently. You have to look at this thing the way it is. Hey, we're saved. Hey, hey, all right, great, great. Okay, let's go. Let's head out towards Canaan. Some of them very shallow. If you think it's over, that ain't over. Now, the next chapter is called the Song of Moses. It's Moses praising the Lord for how he delivers. I can really identify with this chapter how he has delivered me from years and years of trial and fire and disappointment and unhappiness. The reason is my happiness depended upon my own personal wants and God has caused me to want the things that he wants in my life. He's helped to conquer my enemies and my biggest enemy was Jim Brown. Let's read some of this song of Moses. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel. This is like one of Moses' psalms. You have to, you can't understand what this song of Moses is this is a glorifying of God for delivering him. I could sing this song with Moses for having delivered me from all my enemies that I had when I was young. And I used to want my enemies dead. And when they started dying, I was a lot older and I didn't particularly care if they were dead anymore. You see, God will get his enemies that you think are your enemies, but they're enemies because they're enemies of God. He raises them up as swords to cut you down. And he says, I'm going to take you through this. They were supposed to cut you down. I had them do it. If God would just stick his head out of the sky and say, I am ordering everything in your life. Do you understand that, Summer? <laughs> it would be easier to take, wouldn't it? Uh, if he just stick his head out of the sky and say, that ticket you got is from me. Your insurance is canceled because I had that happen. But he did that. He's already done that in this book. Hasn't he? He said he works all things after the counsel of his own will. He's declared the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, everything that's not yet done. He says, in everything give thanks. You mean in the Red Sea? Well, yes. You mean in my enemies just overcoming me and overwhelming me? Well, yes. Because it's going to teach you to trust God. And I know people here have had things they just don't think they can overcome. You're not going to overcome them. He's going to and you're not even going to understand it when it's over with. When you get older, you don't really understand how it happened. You just know that it happened, don't you? I'm looking at older people to say this. You know it happened. But you look back and go, how did I get here? How'd I get on this side of the Red Sea instead of that other side? And it happens. Don't worry. You'll come through. When you're a believer, you're going to get to the promised land. And it won't seem so important. Do I have any time? Let's read some of this. Moses is, this is a song to glorify the sovereign will of God putting this in them, not just for delivering them, but for putting them in this situation so God can deliver them and will deliver them. This is sovereignty here, isn't it? Who's in charge and ordered Pharaoh to do all of this by hardening and softening and hardening his heart? God is the one that's in charge here. 
Who got Joseph sold into Egypt and kept him over there with his family for 400 years and had him bring Joseph, Jacob over and all of Jacob or Israel's family? Who arranged that? Job, Jacob said, uh, Joseph said, God sent me here uh, to preserve life. He sent me over here for a great deliverance of Israel. 400 years before they're delivered, Joseph said he sent me here for this great deliverance. And if he could have known Moses' name, he'd say there's going to be a name Mo man named Moses that's going to lead you out in this great deliverance because we need a law. Without Israel being in bondage, there would be no law at Sinai, would it? And there wouldn't be a, a corresponding law written on t tables of our hearts, wouldn't there? So you had to have it. All of this is by the will of God. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider hath he thrown into the sea. He wanted them in the sea. He didn't want to save them. He didn't want to save everybody. This, this is the sovereign will of a living God. Everything that happened. The Lord is my strength. Not I am my strength. Let's get out of that. Quit fighting your enemies. David said, you plead my cause, Lord. Plead rude means to fight. When you feel like you just have no way out and you feel like Moses up against the Red Sea, just keep busy. I get real depressed sometimes, but that has nothing to do with... I have learned that my mind, my rational mind doesn't have anything to do with what I'm going to do. My, rash, my rational mind keeps me doing what I'm supposed to do regardless of my emotional mind. Let me put it that way. My emotions don't have... I come here and preach sometimes I don't feel like... But that didn't, whether I feel like it or not doesn't have anything to do with whether I'm going to do it or not. Does your feelings have anything to do with whether you're going to go to work on Monday morning? No. Well, then learn to, learn to be towards God the same way. You'll reap a reward in due time if you... Faint not. Word means to relax. If you don't sit down and quit, you'll reap a reward eventually. You'll go into Canaan just like they are doing. The Lord is my strength and song. You can't really understand this unless you've come out of a Red Sea situation. And He has become my salvation. He is my God. I will prepare Him in habitation. My Father's God. I will exalt Him and not myself. This has not been by my will. It's been by the will of the living God. What I've come through. The Lord is a man of war. That don't sound like the God of these people up at these churches in the charismatic network, is it? He's a man of war. The Lord is His name. He's at war with the world. He's at war with our enemies. Pharaoh's chariot and his host hath he cast into the sea. He took Pharaoh in there. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. This is his song of deliverance. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. He's getting pretty graphic, isn't he? They're drowning, sucking water. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. The right hand of God is Jesus. He sits at the right hand of the Father, doesn't he? Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. Jesus is the I Am of the Old Testament. And in the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Who did they rise up against? Moses? They rose up against God. That's what, remember the prayer over there in the 14th chapter, Asa's prayer. Lord, let not man prevail against thee. A thousand Ethiopians in their chariots of iron were coming against Israel. And Israel had half the number, had 500,000. And Asa said, let not man prevail against thee, O Lord. When men attack us, we are the wife of Christ. You attack a man's wife, you're attacking him. Don't you go after a man's wife. You've got to fight him. You have to fight God. So I, I warn people, you come after me and you try to hurt me or this church, if I am God's preacher, 
God will get you. And I don't apologize for that. In the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as a stubble. He don't sound like he's being too nice. God is love. He loves the Egyptians too. No, he does <laughs> No, he doesn't. They're vessels of wrath. And with the blast of thy nostrils. Boy, that's, I think of that 38th chapter of Ezekiel. God says, he says, my fury is going to come up in my face. And the word fury means nostrils. He says, I'm going to breathe fire upon you when I destroy Magog, at Gog, when I destroy Gog. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upon as upright as a heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. It means thickened or cradled, like curdled like milk in the heart of the sea. And the, that's what they were like when he pulled the chariot wheels off of their chariots, it was like driving through a bunch of curdled milk. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide and spoil. And he's talking about our enemies. God's enemies are those who are friends with the world, isn't it? aren't they? Friends with the world are enemies of God. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my lust. I will draw my sword my hand shall destroy my enemies. Thou didst blow with thy wind. The sea covered them. They sank as, as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretchest out thy right hand. The earth is swallowed them. Sam reminds us of the earth swallowing up the followers of Kor in the 16th chapter of Numbers, doesn't it? God says, if I'm, Moses said, if I'm not the prophet of God, this earth will open up and swallow you 280 followers of Korah. And it did. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. The people shall hear and be afraid. Saul shall be taken on the inhabitants of Palestine. Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed. Edom is just below the Dead Sea. That's the Esau, descendants of Esau. The mighty men of Moab, that's southern Jordan, trembling shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away when they all see the fear of God when Israel travels through the wilderness, comes up here through the land of Esau or Edom, comes up here through Moab, and they come back. He's talking about, I'm fixing to lead Israel through 40 years and everybody that's in the way are going to be amazed and terrified and tremble at the pathway of my people. Because I go before them and I follow after them and that's us. Quit worrying about your life. You're exactly where you're supposed to be. Just work hard today and don't think about tomorrow. Take no thought for the morrow. The morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. There will be enough evil to go around tomorrow without you worrying about it today. What verse was I in? Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab trembling shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan, when you get back to the land of Canaan, are going to melt away. They're all going to be terrified when they see my men who believe in me leading. And he's talking about everyone from... Othniel to Ehud to Gideon to Jephthah. Fear and dread shall fall upon them by the greatness of thine arm. They shall be as still as a stone. They'll be terrified when the wrath of God comes upon them. He's not talking about leading them to Christ, is he? Till thy people pass over, Lord. These are the Gentiles that God's going to pour out of His Spirit in Acts 2 when He blinds the eyes of the Jews, isn't it? Because there's going to be an elect people from every nation, tongue, and tribe. Till the people pass over which thou hast purchased. The people which thou hast purchased. How did He purchase them? With the blood of that Lamb that was offered upon the doorpost. And we're purchased with the blood of Christ. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. That's us. 
Thou shalt bring them and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance. That's Moriah or Zion where Jerusalem shall sit. That's the same place that Moses and Moses, Abraham was going to offer up Isaac in that 22nd chapter of Genesis. In the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. For the horse of Pharaoh went in with his chariots. Pharaoh died with him. And with his horsemen into the sea, and the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them. This is Moses praying, praising God for the death of his enemies and how God brought it about. You say, well, God ain't showed me how he's going to bring it about. Maybe you're, you haven't gotten there yet. He's not going to show you ahead of time. He says, I'm going to do it. Now, you've learned to trust in me. We walk by faith and not by sight. God's not going to give us a map about how he's going to conquer our enemies. We need to be like Elijah and Elisha. Elijah got a little discouraged too, didn't he? He was running from Jezebel and Ahab. But the children of Israel went in dry land in the midst of the sea. And Miriam, the prophetess, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. And Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And then they come up on their first situation with no water, and they start murmuring against God. After he did this, you're going, huh? What is wrong with these people? I don't know what's wrong with us. When God makes all these promises to us, I'll be with you. All you have to do is seek me. And ye shall live. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Help us to realize, Lord, that you're our Savior. You're our refuge, our fortress, our rock in a time of storm. All we have to do is learn to believe you and quit believing for things. That's not what we believe. We believe your way. We pray and bow to your will. Lord, help the church to grow strong in the truth. Help the flock to be completed, to add to their faith, and to mature. God will praise you for all things and glorify you. Lead us to your elect, open up doors for the ministry, and we'll keep preaching these truths in Christ's name. Amen.